welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Hello and welcome to Turn the Page podcast. I am Megan, a children's librarian here at Syosset, and I have here with me Natalie, I'm also a children's librarian. Hi. And we are so pleased to have the author Erica Lewis on our show. Um, We are so thrilled. Um, Erica has written Kelsey Murphy and the Academy for the Unbreakable Arts. And the publication date is March 1st, 2022 of this year. So we can't wait to get started talking about this amazing book. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, Thank you for having me. What inspired you to write this book? Like, I just found, like, I got, like, all different vibes from all, like, some different books that I had read, and there's the mythology aspect. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. You know, um, I've always been um, a fan of reliving my own childhood <laughs> and writing for kids. Um, I, uh, it, it's been, I started out working in television for many years, um, and then shifted over into writing prose, which has been an amazing journey. And um, one of my other big passions is traveling. And I spend a lot of time in Ireland and in the UK. I went to university uh, for a year there uh, on a semester abroad and then just kept going back and eventually stayed over there for a while. Um, And uh, I, I have a, I love all things creepy and old and ancient. So wandering around graveyards through ruins. I just, I, I, for me, it was Fort Ward as a kid growing up in, in Alexandria, Virginia. And, and I just, I I don't know, and sense my imagination going crazy. So um, this particular story was inspired by a trip that I actually dragged my entire family all the way through the highlands of Scotland up to the Isle of Skye, because I had heard about this uh, legendary, school this 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 story about skyhawk who's this um uh she was a some called her a goddess some called her a spirit that you know there were all different kinds of uh, uh stories about who and what she was but she taught all the biggest heroes in irish mythology how to fight with martial arts and magical weapons and her original school was actually on the isle of sky um so you could go to the ruins and there's some that you have to test to get into this school actually in Kelsey Murphy um, and the Academy for the Unbreakable Arts is very much based on the school that that she had there that has now been moved into the other world um, and you have to test to get in it's not an, an easy test in fact the bridge of leaping that is in the story is taken right out of uh, the original mythology um, that the bridge would just throw you off when you tried to cross so yeah, Kelsey is such an interesting character because there's she has such like she has power and she can't like wield it correctly. She's got kind of like this like uncanniness about like she's unable to like she has to, you know, wear the gloves and she has trouble controlling her power. Yeah. I thought she was just it was such like a strong female character that I wanted to see right now. Um Oh, thank you. Yeah. 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 So Kelsey, you know, the one thing about her is that she's, she's always had to kind of grow up on her own. So she had that going for her in many ways, in in a weird way, it, uh, something that, you know, if, if, if you are one of those kids, cause I know I very much was growing up where I didn't feel like I had a lot of parental attention and you're kind of doing your own thing and figuring everything out on your own. And, and in a weird way, it's a struggle, but then as like with Kelsey, she gets thrown into these situations. And of course hers are much more extreme with powers exploding and not knowing what the heck is going on. Um, But on the flip side, she's got that, that strength that I think a lot of kids have that have to do things on their own, their own laundry, they're on this, they're on that. They've learned to do those things. And, And so when the, when the crazy stuff starts happening, she can fall back on that, that part of her. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, the one sad thing for poor Kelsey is that she just didn't grow up um, with other people like her. Um, and even at the school, there's not that many like her right now. Um, so she's just trying very hard to figure out not how not to 
to get kicked out of school, <laughs> you know, without spoiling too much. <laughs> I know, Natalie, you had a question about um, her upbringing or like we didn't hear about her parents. Like, yeah, you know. rolling into that, I noticed that there are no mother figures um, in the book. And I was going to ask you. Is there... oh, that's interesting. I never really thought of it that way. Um, there, I, You know, for me, um, Skyhawk is is a big mother figure. She's a she's a she is the the preceptor, the principal of the school. She's, um, you know, Dumbledore in that sense, I guess you could say. Um, but she's, uh, she is a, a figure that has stepped in, you know, Kelsey didn't really have either figures. She had this sort of caseworker that was in and out of her life who we're not going to talk about because that spoiled too much, but, um, there, there aren't a lot. Niall doesn't have any Brona, but I, you know, without going into too much giveaways of the story, um, they don't have a lot. But Zephyr has an incredible family. And it, this is a series. The book is a, is a is the, this is the first of a series. And, and Zephyr's family um, and the strength of having all of those, you know, mothers and fathers and siblings that are around you, um, it, it's kind of a, a good thing why he's the charger of this of this Fianna because for him he's got this this family that's bolstered him up so much on all sides mothers fathers um that that he he has this strength of confidence that comes from that and uh and it it really helps the others as they're trying to to cope with things but yeah I don't want to go into Niall's mother too much but boy she's terrible (laughs) (laughs) you'll see even more of her in book two (laughs) Um, each character is so distinct and memorable and um I guess which character do you feel that you relate to in the book um, that's really interesting. You know, I think if I, if I was going to relate to one, the most, it would probably be, I I don't know, for me, it probably would be Kelsey. Um, I was going to say Niall, I struggled a lot, um, growing up learning how to read. So for me, if, if I had a, a handicapped and I don't like to call Niall handicapped because he was born without a hand. So he doesn't ever feel handicapped. He doesn't feel like he can't do anything. Um, but I think for me, that was my issue growing up is I just, I had to really overcome and I was too embarrassed to talk about it. So for me, it, it took a lot of, um, figuring out what, what was wrong with the way I was reading. Cause I was moving. It wasn't your standard dyslexia where, you know, words were switching. It was more like, um, my, my, what I was thinking wasn't coming out in the pen and vice versa. It wasn't trickling back up the same. It was a little bit different. Um, and I just had to sort of overcome it. Um, and so for me, it's like with Kelsey, she, she never likes to ask for help. Um, and I think that that was sort of, that was sort of me growing up. I always hated to have to ask for anything. She's such a strong character. I I really loved her. I love her. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Core group of you know, the, the first year group, um, they're really like quite the outcast. Like, it's not like you see in some other, you know, novels like this, where I've seen like, they're all like, oh, they're the popular kids. They're the ones, they're the chosen ones, but Kelsey isn't the chosen one and the idol. So it's a very different story. So I really appreciated that perspective on things because it's like the opposite effect. A lot of the school of that core group, they're always like, a little bit nervous kind of in a sense and a little bit intimidated like by yeah. that that group the group of friends so it's like that was very interesting perspective oh thank you yeah they're all kind of bullied in different ways um I think you know it, but they all come from different perspectives of it too and and the other thing that was important for me um with because I found this a lot when I was a kid um I, I was you sort of met this person and you had a first impression and you kept that first impression and whether they were nice or mean or said something to you, it immediately stuck in your brain as how you were thinking of them. And, and um, particularly like with Brona, Mm -hmm. you know, Kelsey had this vision of her and this thing she thought about her. And, and, you know, one of the things that I found a lot of times is people don't know what other people are struggling with. They don't know the reality that there's other things behind 
that bravado and other things that they're putting forward. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, even, even those who you feel are kind of bullying with their perfection aren't, you know, they're not, nobody's perfect. We all feel like we're not perfect. You know, we all feel like there's something wrong. So. Yeah. yeah. um, Going back to Brona, like from, you know, learning that she's the daughter of these gods and goddesses, like you already sense, like you, you just imagine in your head, like, oh, this character was like going to act this way. And then I really appreciated how you put in all the detail about her character. It's like, no, you know, she has her own struggles <laughs> things going on. Can you so, tell we love the book? We love, <laughs> we love the book. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, she, she was, um, you know, and, and even, even going forward it, you know, as, as these characters continue, cause I'm, you know, struggling along with them right now through book two, it's very, um, it's always important for me. And I don't know if this is partly my, my, my coming around from a TV perspective of things, because, you know, we've had different layers of storylines we were telling and, uh, I have a math background too. So I like things in a neat package with characters having their storylines kind of going somewhere and morphing and changing. And so for me, um, I felt like it was really important that all of them have their own stories to tell, um, even though it's it's Kelsey's book in that way. Like they all have their own their own thing and um, and obstacles to get over. Right. Because that's how they change. Exactly. There's so much character development and we learn so much about more about the world that Kelsey goes into. Mm -hmm. She starts in the human world and then she ends up in the land of summer. Yes. Creatures from the land of winter. So I'm almost like, I would like to see, like, I'm almost thinking in my head, where is the map for this? Because yes, it's, I'm hoping, well, I I actually, hold on. If I can, I, well, hold on. If I can reach it. I so what I do if it's so this is the lands of summer (laughs) which you can't really see very well and then this is the lands of winter um because in book two we will be going into the lands of winter as well I don't want to give away too much um as well as into the rest of the lands of summer so there will be you know as the story grows um we'll get to see everything and in, in different places and and especially I found it it's really important for me to continue on with the story um and see Chawa Woods which you know without spoiling too much is where a lot of the Fomorians have been well where all the Fomorians have been moved um so yeah that like story that yeah that was one of my questions is are we going into the lands of winter or, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are definitely going into the lands of winter I've been there for a while now and it's really cold <laughs> are we going to go back to the human world or yes, yes. we are going back to the human world the one thing about the human world which which you you find out a little bit in this book because I think um Sky explains it that the the way that the sidrels work is that they they are sort of the the, the human world is is the problem for lands of summer and winter because that's how they keep getting into each other's worlds by simply stealing a bow because obviously there are people in the human world that are from spies effectively from both of these realms that are using those portals to go back and forth and so we learn a lot about how those portals work uh, in book two in particular, but that's in book okay. one. Awesome. That was another one of my questions. Like how are we getting back and forth so quickly? Like some of the. Well, the tree travel, but you know, the way it works is that these, uh, these um, trees, the, 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 in the lands of winter, they have their own, you know, and they travel through the root system. So they're, they're going through the root system where the lands of summer are going through the, through the rest of the tree, so to speak, um, and the branches branch out. And, and in Celtic mythology and Irish mythology in particular, uh, trees take on um, a very important role. When you go there, you'll see a lot of hawthorn trees that have offerings to the fairies, like hooked on them pacifiers and all kinds of stuff and and basically those are considered portals to the other world i mean there's the there's obviously the mounds that they've built and all that but the trees themselves are portals where the fairies come in and out 
And so I really wanted to bring a lot of their um, their natural elements into the story. And the the silver bow is actually literally something from Celtic mythology, from Irish mythology, where you had to be given a, a branch from these trees to be able to access the other world. So. Oh, I love how it's like all natural like that, like everything, like are some of the portals not trees? Like, I don't know if you can answer that. Yeah. No, not in, not in my, not in, no. I mean, the, there, the, there's this, unlike like the Percy Jackson stories and the, um, a lot of the other stories that are around the multiple mythologies these days, this isn't about those gods and goddesses. This story is um, about, is, is honestly, it's about war and it's about two sides that have been fighting forever for so long that they've forgotten why they're fighting. I mean, that ultimately we will, um, on the bigger picture scale of things, um, see these kids really uh, change change the other world. But in changing the other world, they stay of our world. So it's 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 um, it. They, they, this story is more about the the repercussions of all that, um, as opposed to like um, you know you know having them in their lives every day. They can't. The, the gods and goddesses in Irish mythology were um, the children of Danu are, uh, they weren't walking down and, and um, you know, changing the entire existence of a place, so to speak, that wasn't there. Uh, and, and in this particular story, they, they, they have their own stuff, though. So. And they don't choose sides. I mean, they choose sides, but there's too many of them on both sides, so... <laughs> Was Kelsey always going to be part of that smaller group of warriors because at the school she's not, you know, it's like there's not many other students like her, like with her specific types of powers mm. and things. Where was she originally planned to be like that? Um, and is she yeah. based on a mythological character? Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the things that um always stuck in my head, and, and I remember saying this to my editor, is that I I, I love uh reading harry potter but one of the things that i always wondered was what if he'd been put in slytherin he fought so hard against being a slytherin and and honestly i'm always sorted into slytherin so i took a little offense to that but i was like you know i don't understand um because it's a good house and and so for me they're they're not being the most popular character um for me i i she I wanted, uh, yes, I, the, the, the story of the Fomorians is right out of Celtic mythology in Ireland. They were, um, they were basically colonized by, by the gods and goddesses. So they came down into, they were already living there, the Fomorians and the Furbogs. And then um, the, uh, the Tuatha de Dan, they came down in, typically, I think if you looked at real history, it would have been like the, um, the Norsemen coming in. Because they have all kinds of stuff about it, but in this particular um, uh, version of it, in in what I was told by many different um, uh, folks that uh, I read and talked to, was that they 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 came down maybe from the heavens. They don't really know where you know, but they came down and they kicked out. They they fought with them. They tried intermarriage, and so the Fomorians were real. So um, with Kelsey, one of the things that I I wanted to to do and I had always planned to do was make her a part of a den that had 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 a big past which of course is a past that ties into hers um uh, um you know people who who uh there aren't very many of them there and she's kind of used to being the oddball out so it doesn't bother her in that way she 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 can you know she's she's had that chip on her shoulder and she's just wearing it and keeping it calm. But, but she, to be, and I'm, I'm working in, in book two, it's even more important that she's a part of this group that is sort of ostracized because she's um, about hoping to make changes in their world and in, and in the world and for the better of these people that she didn't even know that she was a, a clan, a part of their clan, so to speak. So it had always been planned. Um, in that way. Um, and the Sega Den is the coolest den. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I think I was partly inspired a little bit from Avatar, The Last Airbender, because I did love that so much. But I love elemental powers. And supposedly the Fomorians had some of those. So I got to play with that a little bit. 
Yeah, that was like the coolest like dorm room I'm calling it, but it's like their den. It was just I like know. raining so cool. about yeah. it. I'm like, I, like, I wanted to have a den with a pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was going to something. I completely forgot about the den. Um, if there's like one moral or one lesson you would want readers to take away from the fabulous book, what oh. would it be? Um, just one, um, or more than one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, I, I think the, one of the biggest moral themes of the story is not to judge a book by its cover, mm-hmm. um, not to, um, look at a person and decide who they are when you first meet them and to give people a chance. Um, you know, it's, uh, even if you feel like they are not the easiest people to deal with it, that that's probably the biggest thing for the four kids in the story of getting to know each other um and across the board because people judge Niall immediately um because he was born with one hand that this is a you know a military school how's he going to be able to get over you know whatever it is he's got to do um and you know Kelsey being uh, suddenly a Sega and judged by all of the past events that have happened around those people um the things that the traumas that have been caused um you know everyone everyone feels like they're they're being judged and it would be great if we could all walk away with just sort of always just accept people for the way they are and you know that would be great work together as a team I love, love that. that. Yeah. yeah, we need books like this, um, <laughs> you know, because it is something different. I haven't read something exactly like this. And it was really interesting learning about all these different characters. And it, it almost makes me questions of the Fomorians. Do they have a longer than average lifespan? They do. I think, well, most of the other worlds, um, you know, the, the, the their, their whole thing was having eternal life so the Fomorians definitely have longer than average lifespans um and you know the men um which of course Kelsey takes great offense to and I can't blame her get these beautiful horns that are like ringed (laughs) which are awesome um and uh so yeah they do live longer than average lifespans they're they're not necessary they're not human and they're also not um at all of the same let's call it the same background, the same uh, um, descending. They didn't descend from the same places as the other summer folk did. So they're different. They're just always felt they're always, you know, and with Kelsey, they, um, they, you know, it's, it becomes fairly obvious. She doesn't realize who she is at first because she, you know, her eyes change um, after she gets to the school. Um, And that's their defining sort of characteristic. Um, across the board is there there and there's a term for that and I'm going to pronounce it wrong but when you have two different color eyes yes I I know what you're talking about (laughs) I'm going to pronounce it wrong Um, (laughs) but yeah they all have that so Um, I just want to say that when reading this like there was a lot of like heart and soul into this book that and I I really loved it there was you know the sense of family the strength the bonds I just I really love this book I just want to say that (laughs) Thank you. I loved writing it. <laughs> I love being in their world. I have so much fun, you know. Um, and it is hard. I mean, there is a lot of dramatic moments, you know. I um especially uh I I I enjoyed that as a kid. For me, I liked those tales that had extreme highs and extreme lows. Um and and the action adventure. I mean, I you know. I grew up on Star Wars and comic books. I mean, I I, I loved comics. Uh, I still love comics. I still I write comics. <laughs> For me, it's like a. Um, but I I I I like that mixture of both, and and I feel like kids today are so lucky because they do get a lot of um, so many great action adventures, but it's. It warms my heart to know this feels different because for me, it, it felt like it's got a lot more that, you know, I always wondered, you know, I was so disappointed that Luke Skywalker never got to know Darth Vader. You know, <laughs> it's like, come on, you know, I just met at the end and it was all over. He died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> are so there what, other oh, Sega that we are going to need? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Later on we are. Okay. Good. As the story unfolds, I mean, this is going to be about you know, it, it's it's the school and 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 how you know Kelsey has to become a hero, not just um, along with her Fiana for for the tragedies that are going to strike of course, that have to strike in every story. Um, but more so than that, she's got to become a little bit, um, uh, even in book two, she's got to slowly start to become a leader of her own clan that she doesn't even know very well because she is at the school and is this sort of um, character. And and I don't want to spoil everything, but having the family background that she does she has to be a part of that voice of change because people look at her in a negative light across the board, you know, even, even her own people after revelations come out. So, you know, about who she is. Are there, there's four years to the, to the school? Um, the school has four years right now. Um, we're doing uh, at least three books. Um, I'm uh, I, that we've, we've been picked up that much. I'm assuming that the, it, you know, we'll add the fourth one at, at that point. We, uh, I had originally arced it over three years um, and three school years. So from 12 to 15 and then by 16, they're off and they're, 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 they're commissioned. Um, but uh, I'm feeling like there needs to probably be a fourth year. <laughs> so. How long did it take you to write this book? Um, it took about two years, but I was fortunate because um, the editor that I was working with at the time bought it on proposal. So I wrote it and I wrote the first like five chapters, um, which are very different now. Um, and uh, it, there's some great stories around that first chapter. Um, <laughs> it used to have like three more before it, <laughs> before you ever got to the museum. Um, so it's sort of funny, but we had uh, it. We uh, it took about two years to really um, flush out everything, and that was after me even mulling it over for a year before that. So this is this. Is, it takes time, you know. It's hard. Yeah, mm-hmm. thanks for writing a book. And do the characters come first to you or the story? How do you usually? Do um, yeah. For me, uh, generally speaking, the character and the story sort of develop at the same time there I, I start with the idea so that for me whatever the idea is going to be around like I really wanted to write around that, about that school that used to exist uh on the Isle of Sky, and so then it, for me it was okay so what story do I want to tell um and what kind of character is going to be the best at um basically in my mind almost uh not fitting into the world that I'm creating. So I sort of work at the same, I work through both the character, you know, a lot of people will talk about the character's voice speaking to them. And I think when you write in first person, especially in young adults, um, definitely. And, and maybe I'm not writing in first person in this right now, it's third person. So uh, for me, um, I definitely hear Kelsey all the time, but uh, all the other characters come to life just as much in my brain all you know as I'm is is when I was developing this um they all sort of took on a a different role and I um I wanted everyone in Kelsey's group I knew I wanted to tell a story from a character perspective of people who were not popular who were who were flawed who had something they were struggling with that was just important for me um uh so uh, then I started developing the characters, I guess. How do you keep the characters all straight? Do you have like a book in your? Well, yeah, this particular one, um, I've started to do flashcards and they're in a little binder um, because it's more that they aren't all your average everyday looking, you know, like the winter characters are coming in now and I've got summer characters and sometimes the book does feel like it's got a lot of characters. I try to keep them small. I mean, with, with Zephyr, uh, Brona, Nile, and Kelsey, I, I mm-hmm. not a problem um, with the main characters, even when it comes down to like uh, Nile's parents who are a bit in this story and his sister and all those different kinds of things that that come out. Um, 
those I've got down. But when it comes to the kids at the school, I have a book and I know what I know what den they're in and I have all the first years arced out. I hadn't done the entire school until uh, about two weeks ago. I finally started layering in all of the classes because the school isn't huge. Um, you know, it's not like a thousand kids. So it's, it's, uh, they only take a small class every year to train because it's the elite. So, right. Uh, really hard to keep track of. And the eye colors are all weird, you know, <laughs> purple, yellow. So, yeah. yeah. Are there different languages that are spoken in between the different worlds? The only language that, um, I've, introduced so far has been an ancient language that, that is completely fictionalized that I made up that's Fomorian. Mm-hmm. Um, in their group, I think it's more, there's, uh, in, in book two, you start being introduced to some of the other, the places, you know, where pixies are and mer people and uh, a lot of different kinds of creatures, which we're kind of familiar with, but won't feel exactly the same, obviously in mine and some of them are mixtures of the two uh they do have their own languages that they speak but um they're not languages that we would hear here just not spanish or or, or right exactly i always like that extra level like in fantasy books like i was so happy you included that language because it just gives it another element like we're entering into it like a different world and it's like it's really an escape right? You know, like, yeah, well, and for me, the having I the the ancient Fomorian languages remind me a little bit of like, talking to my grandmother, when she would speak sometimes with Yiddish, Mm -hmm. like I would, (laughs) there'd be words I'd pick up, but I didn't quite know them all. But Kelsey's mind automatically, you know, she's, she's, um, because of who she is, which we figure out, um, her mind sort of knows that language. And so even more so we learn more of that. And I think that that I tried really hard to make it more about when she's with her grandmother um, and when she's seeing people that she would potentially pick up more of those words and we would hear more of those words, but um, not too much. I mean, there is one character who we meet in here, Madame Ledoux, who does have a hardcore French accent. And I have to tell you, translating that sometimes into the written word is is such a hoot. Um, because uh, last year in, in book one, it was more of a, a strange mixture for a good reason, which we find out later. Um, and uh, and this year, she's she's of course is back and very French. <laughs> yeah. Are we going to see more of a character that was kind of in the background in this book that becomes more of a central character in the next book? Yeah, we'll see a lot more of Ollie, um, mm-hmm. who. Um, uh, less of Killian because he graduated. Um, uh, we'll see um, a lot more of um, Elliot Blizzard. But now I'm kind of giving stuff away. We'll see a lot more of some of the other characters who were in this. Um, and we also, I we introduce characters from the Lands of Summer who are um, uh, go to a rival school um, without saying too much that uh are up to dastardly deeds (laughs) in the lands of summer yeah so there are other schools out there that's interesting yeah well in mythology too um uh skyhawk had a sister Mm -hmm. um so i'll just leave it at that nice Yeah. Just so interested for the second book. Oh, we can't like, wait. Yeah. <laughs> Mark it in my calendar. Thank you. So we always like to ask, like, what you're currently reading. Um, what am I currently reading? Um okay, it just won the Newberry Award and my brain is not fixing on the, the last quintet, quintet. 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 Yes. 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 And are you liking it? I am very much. I love it. I haven't, I'm only like, I don't know, 50 pages in. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a bigger report at the end. Um, I've been, uh, I try not to read, um, anything that's close to what I'm writing while I'm writing this. And that's, you know, a very different kind of story. Um, and so that it's been really interesting. I, I like sci-fi stories. I read another book recently about, a 
it was a middle grade story about about life on Mars. Um, and I'm blanking on the name of that one. That one was really good too. So I, I do like to. Oh, Lion of Mars. That's yes, Lion I love that. Mars. Great things about that one too. Yeah, I loved it. I loved Lion of Mars. That was so good. That's some middle grade story, and it, had, it is. It's it it went exactly where it needed to go. It made me happy at the end because <laughs> you know I'm a very every, we all have our own um, idiosyncrasies, and I'm claustrophobic. Uh, it started when I was living in London and the tubes would get really crowded at night and I I'm so short I'm only five feet tall and so my face would always end up in everybody's back and I just all of a sudden I feel like I was suffocating and whenever anyone does a story about Mars I'm like how does anybody breathe you know like they're trapped in these small environments but I didn't feel that way when I read it it was actually great and um and really, really interesting. I thought the kids were great. So I highly recommend it. Nice. Thank you. So you like sci-fi. Do you have a favorite author? Oh, uh, I have a hundred million favorite yeah. authors. I mean, you know, I loved reading Ray Bradbury growing up. Yeah. Um, uh, he was, I met, I even got the chance to meet him once at San Diego Comic-Con, which was absolutely incredible. Um, I like reading Victoria Schwab uh, on the, the more adult and YA side of things. I like reading Sarah J. Mass. I like read. I mean, really, I I kind of read everything. I do tend to write, read more fantasy and sci-fi, and um, I'm all I'm I'm good with vampires. You name it, I'll read it. <laughs> um, on the kids side of things, um, I love reading a lot of the stuff from Rick Riordan presents, which is fun. Some it's you know it. It, uh, it, it, Rick Rudin has always been an inspiration, I think, for anyone writing in mythologies. He just really, um, he drags you in and his Apollo series was, I think he wrote that for adults. There's no way he wrote that for kids. I have never had so much fun reading a series. <laughs> it was so much fun. So I highly recommend that for adults too. Um, but yeah, I, I don't read a lot of stuff about I used to, but real life stuff right now, the world feels really heavy and it's kind of nice to escape into fantasy. So I agree. I love fantasy. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah, that escape is needed right now. Like in Kelsey, it was totally an escape reading it. Like we enjoyed, as you can tell, like all the characters and learning about the worlds and everything in this book, like, and it, it teaches children, you know, a good message, you know, too, which is. Thank you for writing this book. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for reading it. <laughs> thank you so much. You're good. Can you tell us um, just one more little teaser about the next book to keep us <laughs> interested? <laughs> we didn't talk about. Um. Yeah. Well. Uh, what can I tell you about the next book? Um. Well. Um. It may not only be Niall who gets to see some of the parental units in the story. Um, uh, there, there may be moments where Kelsey too is got her own uh, issues with her parents going on. Um, and book two is definitely, you know, Kelsey and Brona's um, mothers are, are omens and they can bring good omens and, which they never do. And they bring bad omens because they are our war, you know, they're war goddesses. Um, and that's what they are. Uh, so a very bad omen is going to fall down on the lands of summer and, um, and things, things might get really cold. <laughs> oh, oh well, I can't wait for that. That sounds so exciting. Um, so Kelsey Murphy and the Academy for the Unbreakable Arts by Erica Lewis. The release date is March 1st, yes. 2022 of this year. Um, so we will be really anticipating that release. Um, I hope you, we all, you all enjoyed this episode of Turn the Page today. Um, thank you for chatting with us. Oh, thank you for having me. This has been great. So I'm Megan <laughs> and I have here with me Natalie and the wonderful author, Erica Lewis. Erica. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.